morning, everybody. Um, if you, as we listen to the the people who are in the streets and on the phone and in emails, uh, they've asked us to listen, and uh, we've been doing a lot of listening. But I look forward to listening to the overflow crowd that we have here today and hearing what people have to say. And for anybody who's not here, please email us or call us and give us your thoughts as well. Uh, but some of the things that I've heard in the last um, in the last few days and and, and even the last few years. Um, is that uh, some folks think that the protests in Tampa are about uh, something that happened in another state or with other people. And uh, if you ask any of the people who are taking the time to give us their feedback, they say that's not true. It's in part that, uh, but it's also about things that happen in Tampa. And the only way that we can make change in Tampa is to understand what's happened. And we've talked about, uh, my colleague referred to the to things that happened more than 10 years ago. But if you just look in the last 10 years, and I'll mention these quickly, um, Arthur Green uh, uh, died in 2014, and uh, unfortunately, six years later, that's still in litigation, so I can't talk about it. But um, uh, you know, we have to we have to understand that that these kinds of things happen in in Tampa. And if you don't know his name, please Google him. It's worth paying respect to his family to to research that. Um, not long after that, uh, the Tampa Bay Times came out with. Um, a story uh, that they called Biking While Black, that people um, uh, talked about as Biking While Black. And if you don't know those stories, please look at the Times and, and read those stories about what happened. Um, uh, pulling over children and giving them tickets um, that will travel with them the rest of their lives, maybe hurt their ability to get a, a, um, a, a driver's license or, a, a, or to get a job is, is a horrific way to treat people. And you know, when my own kids have been stopped, um, uh, you know, the, everybody's been very pleasant and, and they've been passed on. Uh, but for some reason, there was targeting in the African American community. And although the numbers have dropped, to my knowledge, uh, that policy was never lifted. Um, also, I should say, I, I talked to both reporters from the Tampa Bay Times who wrote that story years ago. And uh, I said, well, who put you up to doing that? And they said, well, actually, we were looking at St. Petersburg. We thought that St. Petersburg's numbers would be bad. And, uh, and we found that the Tampa's numbers were horrific, so we wrote about it. And one of the reporters happened to be African-American, and I said, what do you think is, is, um, is the difference between the African-American community in St. Pete and Tampa and other communities? She was on her way to St. Louis um, after incidents there. And she said, uh, my uh, honest opinion of the African-American community in Tampa, and this is just three, four years ago, she said they, they feel oppressed. They feel like they don't have a voice, they don't have a seat at the table, and we, it, 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 it makes me emotional because I can't stand the fact that we have people in our community who feel like they don't have a voice. They, we're going to let people speak in a few minutes, but there are thousands for every single person who gets up here and speaks in a little while. We should not have people in our community who feel oppressed uh, by politicians or anyone else that they don't have a right to speak and that their voice isn't important. We have to give them a choice to do that. And if we don't have a dialogue, however difficult the dialogue is, if we don't have the dialogue, we don't face the issues, if we don't have the, the complicated uh, conversations, we're never going to move forward. After Biking While Black, the community uh, rose up and said, we want a civilian review board. And there was a fight about the, 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 whether that was possible. An outside law firm was hired to fight the ability of the public to provide any kind of oversight. And, uh, and you know, it's just an attitude that has been with the city. Um, uh, my colleague mentioned the Jackson House. I was one of the activists several years ago that fought for the Jackson House. Um, uh, the only reason it exists, the, the city had uh, designated it to be torn down. I went, met with R Willie Robinson. He had a letter in his hand that said the city's going to tear it down the Saturday after Thanksgiving when nobody was paying attention. Linda Salsena came in the next day to city council, and it's only because of city council that the Jackson House still exists. Uh, but six years later, nothing's been done in the Jackson House. We've made two or three motions to save the Jackson House, and still it's falling apart. How could we say that that white history or Hispanic history is more important than black history? We're not even saving it. We're not, first of all, we tore down most of the buildings in Central Avenue, and the one important one that's left, we say, well, why don't we rebuild it and move it? Why don't we try to save it and, and understand uh, the history that happened there and the history that happened in the area and why the area was destroyed? Uh, the Bro Bowl is another thing. Uh, the city actually paid for consultants to um, to convince the community that the, the Bro Bowl was a, um, a, a, a skateboard park, to convince the community that, that, that it was a bad idea to have that. They spent $650,000 just to move it, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand probably in legal fees, and caused a lot of uh, racial strife um, just to move it 100, 200 feet away. 
And, uh, and you know, that million dollars that the city spent on the Bro Bowl move should have been spent on the Jackson House. At the time, the Jackson House to completely renovate it was $1.4 million, and it was still salvageable. We, had, we have documented evidence from engineers that it was salvageable at that time. The city, it was making the wrong choices and not making the choices that the community wanted. Skip ahead, Fair Oaks Community Center has never been renovated since it was built. And city council had a um, had a community meeting at at the um, at the community center, and three of us went there and listened to I think more than 100 people speak. And uh, it's a it, the the community said they're concerned about it being a fire trap. They're concerned that it's not updated. It doesn't have a computer center. It doesn't have the amenities that other community centers have in other parts of the city. And worse, it has rats in the in the in, infested in it, and kids ha and others have to worry about rat uh, rat droppings. We, this city council had to make a motion to ask the rats to be removed. And when we went a few months later, the, the community said, can you hear the rats? They're still here. How is it that not, nothing's being done? You can't, we can't even get rid of the rats in a community center. We can't spend the money to renovate it. It's it, for uh, six, eight years ago, the city was proposed uh, by the parks department to spend $130,000 to renovate it. And that still wasn't spent, but we spend uh, $12 million on a boathouse for rich kids from the Northeast to come uh, ride their boats on the river. And we spend a million dollars to fight skateboarders to move a skateboard park. It's, we're making horrific choices in this city. And, uh, and then you sk skip ahead uh, further. Um, and I can't talk about this because I think there's still pending litigation, but there was a, there was a, a, a politically connected white uh, property owner in South Tampa that, that had uh, several years ago $725,000 in code violations. And those were waived by uh, the city. But an African American who has a house that, that also got code violations has fought for years to try to get those lifted. But because that person is not respected politically um, by certain people, they, that one can't get waived. Why is it that there are disparities like this? We cannot have a community where some people are treated one way and some people are treated another way. Look at the RNC convention. We were on the worldwide stage. We had media all over the world. Please, my had my staff do it. Go look at the stories and see the benefit we should have gotten from the RNC convention and we should get from the, from the Super Bowl is the publicity that we get worldwide. But look at that publicity. Almost every single story was negative. Almost every single story had a negative element in it. You, you, the visuals of what was happening at the RNC, the way it was handled by the city, not by the host committee, um, uh, embarrassed our community on a worldwide scale. It was handled in a way that was not the way that other conventions were handled. And we have to pay attention to that. We have to make, we have to have an inclusive community where people feel uh, invited. Um, I'll mention just a couple more. Um, on the west bank of the river, somewhere around a, a thousand affordable homes were destroyed uh, in the last few years with no plan to replace them. And then the Housing Commission came before us and said, there's an official list of 20,000 homes that are needed that people want homes, but the unofficial list is 50,000. How could a city possibly tear down 1,000 homes when we have 50,000 people who want them? Those homes were not nice, by the way, but why didn't we have a plan to rebuild? Where are we going to build those houses? Where are the 50,000 homes going to come from? You know, this body has been trying to use CRA money and other money to spend on housing because uh, we need an emphasis on that. Another thing was that um, uh, uh, um, poor people and homeless people were hanging out in parks in downtown. So what was the city's solution? They ripped out the seats. And guess what? The rich white people who work in downtown can't sit down in the park either. But, um, but some, somehow, because we don't want poor people to sit in downtown, we rip out the seats. This, this, this body made a motion to bring those seats back, and they're still not there. Why is that? Um, if you look at the website Tampa Scorecard that I created, in the um, plus or minus in the last 10 years, the middle class in Tampa stayed the same or shrank. The number of people in poverty increased. Home ownership rate is in po our poverty rates are some of the worst in the state. Gender and racial disparities are horrible. We're one of the worst in the state at those. And we can't get people mobilized to fix these things. What are we supposed to do? Uh, we've tried to. Um, We've tried to refocus the, the, some of the CRA money, and we've had some success, but not as much as I'd like. I'd also like to put a, a limit on some of the CRAs in downtown because there's no slum and blight downtown compared to the other areas we have. We have areas of Sulphur Springs, the, the uh, New Tampa area, and others that have big areas of poverty, and we're not doing anything to fix them. We shouldn't create more CRAs. We should put a cap on the existing CRAs and move the money up there to fix those issues or move them into East Tampa. There's money in the city. It's just being spent on things that are nice to have, not that we need to have. Um, and my colleague mentioned impl implicit bias tra training. When we were on the Charter Review Commission, we added that to the charter, and we still don't have it. 
We've, we've made two or three motions to try to add it in. It's still not happening yet. How do we get these things to happen? Lastly, um, my colleague mentioned communication. Um, last night I was on the phone with, um, with neighborhood leaders. The neighborhood leaders called me in South Tampa and said, we hear that there are gonna be protesters in, in South Tampa. So I called, um, I called uh, the city to try to find out what's happening. And everybody's really busy. We've got two crises going on. Uh, but there's no communication line. I had no idea from anybody what was going on in South Tampa. And that even when I made the calls, still didn't have any intel on what's happening. There was no information that I could give the neighborhood leaders. Neighborhood leaders knew that there were people who were going to be marching right through their streets. They had no idea what to do. And I said, can we please at least give them a list of tips? What are they supposed to do when people come through? Are they supposed to bring them food or stay in their house? And I think we need better communication. Um, as my colleague, Mr. Good said, we need to know what's going on. We, we are the front line dealing with constituents and neighborhood leaders, and we need to know what's happening in the city and how we can give them information, and we need to work to communicate with them about what's going on. And so, sorry to speak so long, but uh, I look forward, this is just what I've heard, and I know I'm, we're going to hear a thousand times more Nat, today and in future days. Please let us know, let me know what you think. And we need to listen, we need to contemplate, we need to reflect, and more importantly, what the community is saying is take action. And it's not enough for us to pass a resolution. Somebody in the city has to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much.